I can remember, I think, from very early age, I used to eat, sleep, drink football. I didn't think of anything else. Some were not happy with the way I used to go about my business. I like trying new things, you know, I like to smile. I said to myself that if I want to be noticed, I need to be different. If I'm just a normal player, I need to add something. I need to add value. Welcome to Nigeria! <laughs> I started on the street like every other kid in my area then. You know, my dad worked for the railways and uh, the only toy we had then was football. So uh, after school, we were out there every day playing until it gets dark. Life was okay, you know. We were not the richest and we were not the poorest, you know. And, Basically, things were easy, especially when you don't have any responsibility. So uh, I would say that life was decent. In Nigeria, football is the only thing that we have that brings us together. You know, we don't have any other thing apart from football. For him, growing up in Nigeria, there was school, and you had to go to school, and, I don't know, 9 to 3 or 8 to 3, whatever. And after that, it was football, until, until night time, until your mum would call you to say it's dinner time, and after that, you go to bed, and then you do it again the next day. JJ can juggle any round object, any, anything, any object in form of a round object that looks alike, like a football, or like has a resemblance of football, JJ has that skill. I think um, I got my natural skills from the street, you know, because um, I was just playing for the love of the game. No instructions, no uh, tactics, nothing, you know. It was all about trying to show what you can do with the ball, you know. He was a street player, and he stayed a street player even as a, as a professional player. But I think when you, and we've seen many street players, like when Rooney, like Paul Pogba, who learned to play in the streets more than in their grassroots local football club, I think then you see the way they play, that they've got that sort of streetwise attitude with the ball especially. And I think that makes them very special players. I'm from a, a football uh, family, you know, and I think, um, their success in football was what encouraged me, you know, because I was looking up to them as well, wanted to do better than they did. He's so skillful. The guy is skillful. The guy, I'm telling you, is awesome. I don't know the magic in his foot. I don't know his thinking, but this is a player I've assessed during training sessions. I remember when I went for my second trial, the manager then asked me, are you sure you're strong enough? Are you sure you're <laughs> good enough to compete? I said, well, all I need is just an opportunity, you know, because I was that small, I was that young. But then at the end of the day, he signed me, and uh, I must say that he played also a, a big role in giving me the early confidence that I needed you know, to know that I've got something going. JJ's, the name JJ sinks in people's mind. If JJ is going to dribble you now, JJ is going to dribble you. If you're not careful, you go on your nails. You see? So somebody with such quality is not easily forgotten. Never. And this has made JJ outstanding in the minds of Nigerians. When I went to Germany, that was where I think I faced my toughest challenge, you know, leaving 
my country at the early age, being accepted by a manager, uh, and uh, he trusted me at that early age and, and believed in my uh, talent. I don't think people really realize how difficult it is when you are a young African boy to leave your country and your continent, not just your country, but your continent as well, to go to Europe. And I think you need to be so strong mentally to cope with all those changes, everything that is so different, to then go and make it. Because the talent is there, but I know thousands of talented African players or from other continents who never made it, who came to Europe and never made it because they were not strong enough mentally to cope with all the changes and all the differences. I think such goals comes maybe once in someone's career, you know. And it was in Eintracht Frankfurt that I learned how to become a professional, you know, how to comport myself, you know, how to uh, carry myself. I, I always say that I went to Frankfurt as a boy and left as a man. Going to Turkey, I think he found it easier in a way there to sort of establish himself, establish his technical ability, take control of matches. Turkey was um, a great experience for me. You know, I'd spent two years there, had a, a great time there. You know, it was challenging also because um, the league wasn't really rated, you know, in, in, in Europe. The offer was too good for me to reject. So, uh, but when I got there, I was surprised by the standard of football uh, that's been played in Turkey. So, yeah, I, I had a great two years there. Frankfurt was good. Turkey was the time where things changed. He became a, a superstar over there. You know how much Turkish fans love their football, especially in Istanbul. And he was incredible. Paris have got class, you know, if I may put it that way. You know, Paris is uh, one of the best cities in the world, you know. I remember the excitement in Paris when, when the first rumours of Cheje of Coach are coming to, coming to the club. And I think it looked like a, a great marriage. It looked like, okay, for a glamorous player like Cheje of Coach, full of swag and skills, and all of that, then Paris is the perfect city, isn't it? It's a city of swag and class and all of that. So it really felt like, yeah, those two were made to, to be together. So, yeah, Paris, I think, um, offered me the right balance because um, I, what a city. I think uh, it would be fair to say that every player wanted to go and challenge himself in the Premier League because we all used to see it as the toughest league, you know, where um, especially skillful players uh, would struggle to, to succeed, you know, and, and that was the challenge for me to try and see if I can get the opportunity to go there to prove myself. With signed Yori, uh, and then you know you, you then you you think about JJ and um, when it was happening you think uh, you know skills everything about him was uh, yeah it just made it for for a real good situation for us really and and it gave everyone in the club a boost um, and yeah he come with a big smile on his face and yeah the the rest is history as they say. He loves life, enjoys life to the full. And when you're ever coming in as a manager and feeling miserable, as often as I do, because most of the time 
over the last two years, we've had to accept that we're going to lose more games than we're going to win, just to try and survive in the Premiership. That hopefully is getting better, but when you see the big smile on his face on a Monday morning, he can lift you as well as all the players. Everyone across the globe, everyone who follows football or loves the Premier League, Bolton, you know, gave him a tremendous acknowledgement by Nigerians and fans across the world. Yeah, we met him at the training ground and he was such a, you know, very warm, you know, you could tell right away, you know, very open and, you know, wanting to get to know people, wanting to get to know a lot about Bolton and stuff. And I think he really settled into life at Bolton and what, and what it was about. And we had a real good atmosphere going on at the club and, and what we because of what we've achieved. It's JJ Okocha, the Nigerian playmaker. What sort of impression can he make on the Premiership? He's a player who Sam Allardyce feels has got all the right credentials, but he needs to find his rhythm. When I met him, I was convinced that um, uh, he's got some ambition in him, and um, I w I'm still very ambitious. And uh, uh, that was the kind of person that I was hoping to work with, you know. So uh, he convinced me right from the first day that I met him, you know, to uh, come to Bolton. Whitlow making some space for himself. And waiting is Akocha, the first Bolton Wanderers goal for JJ Akocha. Well, that was to be way up the situation, way the players that you've got up, got, and then pick a system to suit the players that you've got, like, you know, and uh, don't ask a player to do something that he's incapable of doing, like, you know what I mean? So, you know, we think we've got a lot more talent and a lot more flair in the squad with players like Yuri JJ and Ivan Campo. And uh, we think that uh, that has given us a little bit more edge and quality on the ball. It was like a dream when you first when when we first got up into the Premier League, and then we, you know we he brought your York in and you were like, whoa! And he took us to a, a, another level. And just them little you know touches of class, what he brought to the, to the team was was absolutely fantastic. And that he had a great knack of, of, of getting getting them type of players, but I think that's because of his confidence and, and because he had a vision and, and, he had, and he had a plan of, of where it was where he wanted to take that Bolton side. We had a way of signing uh, players that we were struggling in their team, but had experience, you know, in challenging for the title, you know, instead of surviving, and that was what changed uh, the club's mentality. It was always important that you know we brought players in who were going to help, obviously with the quality on the pitch, but you also had to have quality off the pitch. Franson, down by Pedersen, and lashed in by a Kocha. Delivering again, the Nigerian magician in full flow. What it did for all of us in the dressing room, it gave us a lift, but it also showed us what it takes to be top players and, and, and be in the Premier League and, and what, what it takes to, to stay there as well. Good work here by Okocha. Oh, and it's squeezed in! JJ Okocha for... Uh, the, one of the most talented individuals in the world in terms of technique and tricks and ability. He's the one of the only few players uh, in the world in my lifetime that, that comes up with these tricks and actually comes out at the other end having produced that trick to create something. Match day programmes, today's programmes. I would say I found a home, you know, at Bolton because um, my kids were young then, you know, and they felt at home. Uh, it was easier for them to communicate, you know, and I love the, the town, Bolton, you know, so I was local. Um, I, I could go and do my grocery without anybody disturbing me and all that, so I fell in love with this. With the, with the town, you know, and the club as well. And uh, to be honest, I, I never wanted to leave, you know, I thought I could end my career uh, at Bolton. 
Newcastle playing some risky stuff here. And Gardner's got it back for Bolton. Teed up for a Akocha. That's the lift they needed. Danny Mills is off on a rampaging run on his own. And he has it back here, the fullback. Mills, it's a stunning strike. And Bolton are in big, big trouble now. Murphy trying to lace one through here for Juve. Charlton stuck with him but goes down. And Juve retrieves it. Owen wants it in the middle. Owen! Surely now it's clinched the three points against Bolton this afternoon. Here's Petit. And he's played it through the middle. This is a big chance. Carlton Cole! I didn't even know when I signed for Bolton that Bolton had never played two seasons in a row in the Premier League. And uh, it was funny because during our pre-season, the manager asked every player, you know, what you think that it's achievable, you know, during the season. And I was saying, oh, mid-table, you know, I didn't even know that we were going to struggle, you know. So when I said mid-table at the eighth, seventh position, you know, they looked at me as if uh, uh, I'm at the wrong place, you know. That was when I realized that, oh, maybe uh, I'm in for a, a, a difficult season. Defeat not an option. The Reebok is brimful of frenzied fear for the fixture which straddles the relegation line. Bolton haven't lost at home since January. They start the right side of the line. West Ham, whose need is the greater, are oddly enough in fine form. It was basically between us and uh, West Ham, you know, and getting three points uh, against them would make a huge difference. Akocha, Cole manfully trying to get back at him. Akocha is away. Pedersen to his right, Jork F ahead of him. It goes himself and finds the roof of the net. JJ Akocha scores for Bolton. An enormous relief around the Reebok Stadium. I didn't know that the game was going to end 1-0. Go. And that's enough. It's all over at the Reebok. JJ Akocha, the hero for Bolton. It was something what you'd see in training day in, day out, but to actually do it in the Premier League and, 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 and such a such a tight encounter, if you like, it gave us the edge to go above West Ham and, and, and that was such a big win and a big uh, three points. And yeah, JJ was at the forefront making sure that we were, we were, we were um, on top form. And do you think Bolton are now safe or is there work still to be done? Well, we still have four games, 12 points, and uh, we've done ourselves a, a very good favour today by winning against West Ham. But I still believe that uh, there, there are still a lot of work to do and uh, we should stay focused. So tension fills the air. It's one of the biggest matches in which most of these players have ever figured. Millions of pounds riding on the results here at the Birmingham. Here they come, but Wanderers to a rapturous reception. One of these two teams could go down with 44 points, a record in the English game. Here goes Per Frensen! What a ripping goal from Per Frensen! The arms are raised. Play it again, Sam. Kocha through, and Kocha scores. It was written in the stars. It had to be, didn't it? JJ Kocha looks to the heavens and says his thanks. Bolton Wanderers keep their position in the English Premier League. They've done it, they've won the match, that's all they had to do. JJ and for the last six months, you know, really stepped up to the plate and was a real big captain. And that's when you see, you know, when the top players come come to the forefront. It was a struggle, don't get me wrong, but we always had the belief that we had the quality in the dressing room to stay up. Well, uh, I used to uh, dance with Ben Amendi in training, and then uh, 
Sam came to me and said, if you keep us up, I will do the dance with you, you know. So I said, no problem, boss. And he, uh, he's a man of his word, so I... No part of my contract, this. <laughs> it is. <laughs> it is, it is. No, it it is. No. We're on your image rights. <laughs> it's always great when a player and a manager get along very well when you have um, the same target, you know. I think it's a delight for a manager to see that a player has taken to his ideas, you know, and is willing to uh, work with him, give his all, you know, without any ego, you know. I, I think we bonded and, and for me, uh, that was maybe part of the reasons why we were successful. The, the way Sam is, he sort of takes you in as a, as a sort of on a, on a father figure. You know, he's there for you on and off the pitch, and I think that's what JJ needed at that time in his career. He needed someone who could trust him, but also someone who was going to allow him to, to do what he wanted on the pitch and give him that license and that freedom to be JJ Akocha. Akocha! The birthday boy with an open day sizzler at the Reebok Stadium. A stunning strike from JJ Akocha. Ricardo Gardner into Akocha. Akocha! His trickery opened up Charlton and his right foot. When I was given the captaincy, it was halfway through the season, which is such a strange thing to happen, but. The way he ex you know, accepted it from obviously Sam and then sort of come over to me and sort of put his arm around me and was like, good luck and I'm always here for you if you need it and everything else. But yeah, th that just showed what, what type of man he was, you know. A Akocha. Another incisive pass and another goal for Bolton Wanderers. It's Kevin Nolan this time. So I consider a lot of things. It's not always the money, you know, and I know it's not good fighting just for survival, you know, and, uh, but I know that here in Bolton, we've achieved so much with nothing, and I know things will get better, but that doesn't mean that I'm not still ambitious, you know, so it's a very difficult decision to make, you know, of which I hope that I can be able to make the right decision uh, and uh, hopefully uh, the decision will be accepted, you know, if it is maybe still staying here in Bolton or going somewhere else. I didn't really plan for it, you know, I thought I would end my career in England, you know, but then when I realised that the marriage was over, you know, uh, I had to think um, beyond football, you know, and I started thinking of retirement. As quick as um, he come and, and you know and lit the place up, um, it, it seemed that like it just sort of faded quite quickly. And yeah, it was sad to see him go. We, we were all we were all sad to see him go. But I think JJ, you know, he's, he's one of those people who, who knows what he wants, and um, he, he was given the platform of Bolton. A cutcher against Green, cool as you like as well from a cutcher. He was a top, top player and he was someone that I, uh, you know, I'm, I've, I can always look back and say I was I had the pleasure to play with and such good, good memories from I still hope that a lot of Premier League fans, Bolton fans, but also English football fans all around the world would remember JJ's time in England as, as a special time as well because he was a special player. One quality of JJ as a football player uh, as a as a woman being personality as JJ's courage, confidence to the extreme, courageous like the lion. I am really proud, you know, because sometimes we say that you, you dream of becoming a professional, but the truth is that I had no dream. All I wanted to do is to play football because of the love. Uh, for the game and uh, I think uh, 